Welcome to the final session of the Winter Spring 2024 CFR Academic Series. I am Irina Faskanis, Vice President of the National Program and Outreach here at CFR. Thank you for being with us. Today's discussion is on the record and the video and transcript will be available on our website, cfr.org slash academic, if you would like to share these materials with your colleagues or classmates. As always, CFR takes no institutional positions on matters of policy. Uh, we are delighted to have Yang Zhang Wang and Rebecca Katz with us to discuss global health security and diplomacy. We circulated their bios in advance, but I will give you some highlights now. Uh, Yang Zheng Wang is a senior fellow for global health at CFR. He is also a professor and director of global health studies at Seton Hall University School of Diplomacy and International Relationships. Sorry, relations. Dr. Wang has written extensively on China and global health and is the founding editor of Global Health Governance, the scholarly journal for the new health security paradigm. And he is author of um, his most recent book is Toxic Politics, China's Environmental Health Crisis and its Challenge to the Chinese State. Rebecca Katz is a professor and director of the Center for Global Health Science and Security at Georgetown University. She previously served as faculty in the Milken Institute School of Public Health at the George Washington University. Dr. Katz's work primarily focuses on the domestic and global implementation of international health regulations, as well as global governance of public health emergencies. And her seventh book is coming out next week, I believe on Monday, and it is entitled Outbreak Atlas. So you should all look for that. Um, Dr. Wong and Dr. Katz co-authored a council special report entitled Negotiating Global Health Security, Priorities for U U.S. and Global Governance of, Di Governance of Disease. Uh, so we did circulate that in advance. Um, and I think we will begin with Dr. Katz um, to talk a little bit about uh, global health security and diplomacy and some of the findings from your report. So over to you. Thank you so much, and, and really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with everybody today about global health security and diplomacy. Um, I should note uh, I, a, a quick disclaimer that, um, like many people in Washington, I wear multiple hats, including one that works with the United States government, but I am speaking today um, only in my academic capacity and, and not representing anybody else. So we are we're living in interesting times in the global health security and diplomacy space and and just the, the work of global governance of disease A as we speak negotiators are working through what is hopefully a final agreement on amendments to the international health regulations um, and in about a week yet another version of possible text of a proposed pandemic agreement will be circulated to member states in advance of the resumed um, uh, intergovernmental, the IMB, Intergovernmental Negotiating Body negotiations that are now scheduled, I, I believe starting the 29th of April, where they may um, possibly finalize substantive negotiations in advance of the World Health Assembly. It's, it is not a surprise though, that the negotiations themselves have stalled and they've stalled primarily over issues around called access and benefit sharing um, and the, the relationship between developed and less developed countries. Um, there are significant remaining red lines, including related to um, the way that pathogens are shared or the information around pathogen is shared. It's related to um, the production of medical countermeasures, access to medical countermeasures. There continues to be an evolving power dynamic um, at this time of called strained geopolitical tensions. And there are some real questions about the future of multilateralism and just the global governance of disease space in general. So while this is all sorting out, the world is also working on questions like how do we fund pandemic preparedness and response? So there are questions around the, the World Bank's pandemic fund and the breadth and scope. There's the role of what is the evolving role of more horizontal entities like the Global Fund. Um, there is limited response funding in general and overall kind of shrinking budgets. Um, in, in the academic space, there is a really um, 
interesting space that are evolving, looking at predictive analysis and some of the technologies and and scholarship that's coming out to think about how do we predict and, and adapt um, both from surveillance and, and thinking about the evolution of outbreaks. There is the rise of wastewater surveillance. Um, and as the disease threats continue to evolve, um, we're also looking at these threats as part of uh, the climate crisis and a community that's very keen on looking at the role of um, artificial intelligence and changing bio threat landscapes. So there is, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of things that are going on, but at the same time, there is diminished interest in governments as competing priorities re-enter the fray and increasing challenges thinking about response capacity in an age of mis and disinformation and eroding trust in science. So all of this is to say that the, the space is challenging, it's dynamic, there is a tremendous amount of work still to be done, which is one of the reasons that we need to be thinking about how do we use all the tools and approaches that are available to us, including enhanced efforts to focus on the role of diplomacy. I'm delighted to see the launch of a foreign ministry channel for health last month. And we're now seeing ministries of foreign affairs around the world organized, better organized to address health challenges. So um, not all the challenges are easily solvable, but I'm um, heartened to see this coordinated effort. We're trying to more fully realize diplomacy for health. There, there are, there's a lot, there's a lot of swirl, um, but why don't I stop there and turn to, to my colleague, Yang Zhao. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Irina, uh, that, uh, for the council for inviting me to speak at this uh, important event. Thank you for participating. And uh, uh, Rebecca just talked about right, the, this progress, the, the um, ongoing negotiation over the pandemic accord, the need you know, to uh, better organize, to address the challenges we are facing. Uh, uh, when we're speaking of the challenges, you, know, we, um, you might have, if you read the, 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 the uh, suicide negotiating for oil security, I'm going to uh, uh, advertise that one more time. <laughs> um, you know, we basically talk about all these different the global health security challenges, which are real. You know, we already, you know, just uh, experienced uh, uh, a major global health crisis. You know, they are officially it's not over yet, but uh, uh, the spill over the um, it is an important uh, threat, a uh, serious threat we are facing. You know, mind you, that COVID caused more than seven million deaths, right? More than. 700 million infections. That 700 million is clear underestimate, right? Because to my knowledge, right in China alone, they have more than 1 billion people infected, right? Uh, uh, um, and then now WHO is talking about the disease X, you know, that the name given by WHO scientists, you know, to an unknown path pathogen, which they believe could emerge in future. Maybe so it could be, you know, anything, right, uh, with pandemic uh, potential, like uh, uh, could be uh, 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 Zika, you know, could be Nipah, you know, or could be another you know, coronavirus, you know, that uh, could cause a serious international epidemic or pandemic, you know. And unfortunately, as like Rebecca just mentioned, climate change is the major contributor to this increase in risk, right? Warmer temperatures, you know, can affect the transmission uh, uh, dynamics of pathogens. But the pandemic, the climate change alone, can could also cause direct, uh, you know, loss of life and morbidity. Right? The the prediction is that by the end of this century, the millions of heat-related deaths could be comparable in scope uh, to the total burden of uh, all the infectious diseases. Uh, and we also face the threat of you know, antimicrobial resistance or AMR, which is one of the top global public health uh, threats. Uh, the estimate is that the bacteria uh, AMR is directly responsible for 1.27 million global deaths uh, and contributes to 4.95 million deaths uh, in 2019. So you combine this two, right? it's like uh, uh, pretty much close to the COVID deaths uh, in three years, right? Uh, then there's the problem of food insecurity. You know, we are facing a global 
uh, food crisis. This is the largest one in modern history. We talk about nearly 350 million people around the world experiencing you know, the most extreme form of hunger right now, right? And then, and finally, but last but not the least, right, the threats of biotech revolution, you know, that presents new risks, right, to global health security. You know, last time the council uh, had a event, you know, with all the formal national security advisors, you know, participating, speaking, uh, uh, and when um, the, uh, they were asked, is there an issue that's on your mind that's not in the news all the time? Uh, I remember uh, former Secretary Condoleezza Rice, you know, said that I worry that we are not paying attention to things like synthetic biology, which could have a huge impact on things like the pandemic, right? Uh, so, you know, all the threats call for good uh, health governance by the global whole, uh, national uh, level, you know, giving it right, to this uh, implication. Uh, um, but uh, I want to emphasize you know, that the geopolitics actually are, complement, are complicating, not undermining this prospect, right? Uh, when you could talk about you know, certainly right, the armed conflicts by right, worldwide, you know, uh, they can lead to widespread displacement of populations by right, destruction of healthcare infrastructural, disruption of supply chains of essential meds and medical equipment. Uh, and then also increase the risk of infectious disease outbreaks. Right? And certainly, a uh, civilian population will bear right, the brunt of all uh, most of this impact. Right? That uh, uh, we saw right in Ukraine, Syria, now in the Gaza right? Um and Sometimes, but well, this that is of particular importance to global health security. Right? The, this is the issue of lab safety. Right? That the, uh, we know laboratories, you know, taking over by warring parties or in areas under direct attack, risk of releasing the dangerous pathogens that could start an epidemic, not a pandemic, right? Uh, we all, you might recall in April last year, right, the WHO said, you know, there was a high risk of a you know, biological hazard in Sudan's capital, uh, Khartoum, right, after one of the warring parties. Is the lab, you know, holding measles and cholera pathogens and other hazardous materials. Okay. Uh, the uh, um, the uh, Rebecca talk about misinformation and disinformation. You know, the uh, the in a way, the wars all, uh, the, uh, the conflicts also encourage my right, disinformation, misinformation. Right? The, the uh, for example, the wars in Ukraine. Right? They essentially reduce the Russia's incentives to participate constructively in global health governance. Right? Uh, Russia, in order to justify its invasion, uh, launched a disinformation campaign claiming the United States was secretly you know, aiding Ukraine in developing biological weapons. You know, that conspiracy theory sort of echoed you know, uh, by the U.S. far right and in China. Right? Uh, the the the, uh, the wars, of course, also exacerbated other global health issues like food security. Right, that we know the war in Ukraine, right, combined with the COVID pandemic, and actually disrupted the supply chain, fuel the inflation, and aggravate uh, food uh, uh, insecurity problem. Uh, but uh, you know, I think uh, it's equally right, important when we look at the issue of how geopolitics or geopolitical tensions actually hurt, right, the prospect of international cooperation by addressing all the threats we just uh, uh, talked about, right, because geopolitical tensions, rivalries between nations can hinder international cooperation uh, and funding for global health initiatives like uh, disease surveillance, sample sharing, vaccination campaigns, research and development of new treatments and preventive measures, right, the, uh, uh, um, you know, just to use the, uh, my familiar area, uh, the U.S.-China geopolitical competition as an example, right, uh, well, certainly U.S.-China geopolitical competition is not new, right, but it's only recently, right, that China became 
uh, so-called America's most consequential geopolitical challenge, right? The, you know, that sort of leads to a real some uh, thinking, even by international cooperation over issues like uh, the probe of the COVID-19 pandemic's origins, right? Stand for sharing, right? supply chain resilience, right? The, uh, and in fact, in the beginning stage of the pandemic, we saw why right, China basically threatened, right, uh, to use this leading, uh, the status of being a leader by uh, pharmaceutical, active pharmaceutical ingredients in manufacturing, uh, to sort of, uh, like, uh, as a weapon, right, uh, when the Xinhua news agency said, well, if, uh, uh, because the U.S. instituted the travel bans in China, Basically, China at that time was unhappy and said, you know, if we decided to ban our export, you know, of APIs, you know, to the U.S., the U.S. is going to be plunged in, in the, what they call the sea of COVID, right? Uh, uh, so this is an example of how even the medicine could be weaponized, right? The, uh, uh, during, uh, as a result of geopolitical, uh, uh, tensions. And then if you uh, also look at how this U.S.-China geopolitical rivalry could be combined with the lack of personnel, uh, personal exchange, right? The, uh, could the deepen by right, this mutual misunderstandings and misperceptions, you know? So, you know, now we're seeing, right, that even after almost the end of the pandemic, right, that the, uh, the two nations still, you know, had little serious discussions of a public health issues, you know, even though we think like China is actually one of the biggest risk factors, but there is just a, not much enthusiasm in supporting like a serious dialogue with China, right? Uh, incorporating, um, the disease surveillance, right? The, uh, sample sharing, not to mention, right? Like co-development of vaccines or therapeutics, right? The, the, uh, uh, and, and finally, I want to add that uh, these geopolitical factors could influence the availability and affordability of healthcare services and medical supplies, particularly right in developing countries or regions affected by conflict or economic sanctions. You know, that sort of leads to uh, disparities right, between North and South in access to uh, essential healthcare and drugs. Right? The, again, right, the US-China geopolitical competition during the COVID, right, the, when China launched this, the uh, so-called vaccine diplomacy or mask diplomacy, right, the U.S., you know, sort of say, view that as a threat, you know, they, they launched its own mask, uh, vaccine diplomacy. You know, this competition sort of, right, that, you know, mitigated this uh, a so-called vaccine apartheid between the developer and developing countries. Uh, uh, but uh, it also meant, uh, you know, that... Uh, you know, the vaccine diplomacy would prioritize those countries perceived as strategic importance, right? That in turn right, exacerbated the global disparities in access to uh, the vaccines and other COVID-19 supply. Right? So to address those challenges, I think we need to uh, have a global health detente, right, uh, with geopolitical rivals. We need to embed, you know, the health diplomacy in a multilateral instead of a bilateral framework, right? And support the WHO uh, Global Health and Peace Initiative, the GHPI, uh, to better address the underlying diverse critical health needs in fragile conflict leading uh, uh, setting. You know? So uh, uh, with that, I can stop there. Thank you. Hmm? Thank you both. Appreciate it. Uh, let's go to all of you for your questions and comments. Uh, you can click on the raise hand icon on your screen to ask a question on an iPad or tablet. Click the more button to access the more raise hand feature. Uh, and when you're called upon, please accept the unmute prompt and state your name and affiliation followed by your question. Uh, you can also submit a written question via the Q&A icon or vote for other questions. Um, you would like to hear answered in the Zoom window at any time. And if you put your um, question, if you write out your question, if you could please um, include your affiliation, um, that would help us uh, and help our speakers, you know, from your perspective. Okay, so with that, uh, let's go to the first question. Um, I'm going to go to Majubolo Alufanke Okome to ask her question. 
Uh, thank you very much. I'm Mojuba Olu Olufunke Okome, and I teach political science at Brooklyn College. I'm also Nigerian, and um, the pandemic showed a lot of the um, fault lines in terms of um, the global governance um, arrangements for health issues because there were, I mean, the, the vaccine, uh, the disparity in access was profound for Africans. And, uh, you know, the lucky thing is that not as many people as could have died, died. But I'm just wondering, because we've had the HIV AIDS epidemic, we had Ebola, what is the learning from that? And how come we had all these challenges with um, the pandemic that we went through, the COVID-19? The other thing about it uh, that I want to talk about is food. I mean, there's, it, I don't think the problem is insufficiency of food in this world, but distribution equitably. So what would it take? I mean, and there are all these really heartbreaking photos and, you know, documentaries and reports. What is it going to take to solve this problem and, and make things equitable so that lives are not being lost unnecessarily? And then health challenges that come from malnutrition are not generationally um, affecting human populations. Thank you. Who wants to go first? I will um, very briefly and, and inadequately try to address the, the question around um, vaccine equity and then, and then uh, I, will, I will punt on food security. Um, so that's more of young child's expertise. Um, I, I think the, the point you bring up is 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 critical. and the the issues of, of vaccine nationalism, of vaccine inequity are are, um, are what is driving current discussion, uh, debate, the feelings around global governance of disease and the effectiveness of it at all. It is it it, it is the issue that, prompted the beginning of a, of a negotiation for a new um, and it is the, and this but the solutions are why nations are actually stalled right now I think your your question around what have we learned well um, I think what we have learned is that there's whenever anybody talks about future of global governance of disease um, you could probably count the number of times somebody says the word equity. Yet, operationalizing that is extraordinarily complicated. And um, unfortunately, we haven't seen it yet. And I think that you could see that with, you, you know, the um, the MPOX outbreaks uh, and the, the number of cases that were, you said you're from Nigeria, the number of cases that were in Nigeria, the number of cases that have been in the DRC, um, and the... Um, I think it's fair to say insufficient amount of medical countermeasures that have reached populations in sub-Saharan America just for MPOX. So, I I think the the um, there is there is certainly widespread understanding realization that we need to fix this. We need to fix this because we can't you can't actually talk about um, we're all in this together. Or disease spreads, nose nose borders. We all need to work together, and then have situations like you did during COVID, where um, populations just didn't get access to life saving vaccine. So, um, but now getting to the point of trying to figure out how we solve that is exactly what is what is causing the um, the discord in Geneva right now, and I'm. I'm not sure there's an easy answer for you on how it's going to be solved. Well, yeah, I have to, well, I, I totally agree with Rebecca, but there's no easy answer, right? To just to all these questions that the uh, uh, professor just uh, raised, you know, that uh, you know, like a vaccine, uh, 
uh, access, right? We know many of the low-income countries, by right, the, the vaccine access, the, the uh, vaccination rate was even low, very low, even by the by the end of the the uh, the, the COVID pandemic. But uh, you know, there's there's like multiple factors that right, contribute to that. There's certainly right, vaccine nationalism, one reason. But uh, you know, even when we have all these vaccines available, right? That they uh, the COVAX did a very good job of trying to reach by right, this segment of the population. But uh, then there's other issues, like right? The shipment, right? How do you make sure you ship this and distribute these vaccines in a timely manner? That become another issue. Uh, um, so, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, about. You, you, well, this one of the solutions that uh, for the uh, think of you know the uh, the transfer of the technology, right? the, the vaccine technology that is important. Right now, uh, I believe that uh, the pandemic uh, accord will uh, uh, talk about is talking about that uh, the negotiation. But in the meantime, I think we should also invest it to make sure by right, those countries by the. Uh, especially with the manufacturing capacity, with the people they sort of have that uh, uh, sort of investing there, like uh, their their capacity to manufacture the vaccine, by the sort of to uh, scale up the uh, the access. You know that could be uh, 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 one of the solutions. Uh, then, uh, uh, speaking of uh, the um, the lessons we learned from the pandemic, certainly what we have by the the uh, I think. Uh, it's fair to say we know the problems, right? The, the experts, right? the global health experts, public health experts, they know where the problems are. It's just uh, that, uh, you know, many of the issues just are so thorny, you know, that uh, uh, it, it's, again, easy to say that down. For example, we know, right, that the WHO should, right, strengthen its capa capability to enforce, right, the, the uh, the international health regulations, you know, but, uh, you know, in the uh, international system, you know, where anarchy is the rule of the game, you know, that, uh, it, 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 yeah, I think much of this, you know, this enforcement will be still you know, state-centric, you know, that, uh, and driven by, you know, national interests, just like we saw, right, during the, uh, the, uh, the pandemic, right, essentially. By those IHR rules, you know, talking about uh, avoiding, you know, the disruptions in trade, you know, the disruptions to people's movement, essentially by right, turn to be uh, uh, ignored, right, by the nation, you know. The, uh, but there's another issue: is the lack of coordination. When states try to institute all the travel, you know, the trade barriers, you know, they there was no right, the coordination, no cooperation, you know, that uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, created this sort of a tragedy of common situation, right, that in everybody uh, actually was hurt. Um, I, and finally, the issue of the food insecurity. You know, well, this is, again, not something new, but uh, clearly the pandemic right, exacerbated the problem in part because of the uh, this disruption of the supply chain. But in the meantime, there's some, you know, other issues that, you know, could exacerbate the problem, you know, like in particular countries, like North Korea, for example, we know, right, that in this country, what this particularly the world's most isolated state, right, uh, they say, the, the people, you know, say, suggested a situation where it's the worst, right, it has been since the 1990s, you know, but uh, you know, people you could the, the North Korean government certainly could blame right, the, the uh, uh, international sanctions. But in the meantime, the the, the, the government uh, mismanagement, uh, right, uh, the uh, 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 is also to blame. Yeah, it actually sealed borders during the pandemic 2020. That cut off right the, the vital supplies. In that, is also uh, to blame. We could also talk about the so called you know, sometimes it's called war by starvation. This is part of the humanitarian warfare, and especially, uh, you know, in the the the, uh, uh, the war settings, you know, where you know the uh, the humanitarian aid is twisted into fuel conflict. The, the uh, uh, 
uh, the soldiers and warlords, but took to control the food supply you know, as a means of increasing their military and political power. Right? So, you know, that, that deliberate use of starvation, right? this is the term we use, kind of war by uh, starvation, but right? that's also by right, exacerbated in those uh, uh, conflict uh, zones. Uh, thank you. I'm going to go next to the Ford and MyPad. Uh, hello, I'm Genevieve Connell with uh, the Fordham Program for International Political Economy and Development. Thank you for being with us today. And my question is, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a dissent where many people blamed China for the pandemic, which has catalyzed racial violence against people of Chinese or Asian descent in many cases. What implications do such social upheavals and the demonization of a specific group have on global diplomacy and our ability to collaborate in future health response efforts? Well, I, I'll try to, uh, the, uh, 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 to be the first, maybe Rebecca could weigh in. Uh, um, uh, well, this is, again, not something new, right? During the SARS you know, epidemic, you know, that uh, you also saw by the Chinese sort of like uh, blame you know, for uh, sort of uh, causing the, uh, the the epidemic, they always you know target right the certain uh, group of people right uh, to blame. You know this uh, you could if you like uh, it's historical that could betray uh, that, that, that this this is the pattern there right that during the uh, bubonic plague, you know, for example, European Jews were blamed right the, the uh, for for causing the uh, the the, the, the pandemic, you know, that sort of reinforced them to uh, migrate uh, toward East Europe. The, uh, you know, that's certainly what right, the sort of the uh, uh, poison the, the atmosphere you know, for um, uh, uh, tackling the, uh, the the crisis, you know, especially right the, when this intertwined in geopolitical tensions between you know China and uh, the United States, you know, that, uh, remember that, uh, and also the U U.S. internal politics, by the way, you know, the Trump administration trying to find a scapegoat, right, uh, uh, for its mismanagement of the crisis, you know, the China become an easy one, right, the, the, uh, so he sort of like started to, you know, talk about you know, this, this sort of a China virus, right, or comf uh, flu, you know, right, uh, the, uh, thing, you know, that, uh, uh, only uh, by the, the uh, um, uh, sort of uh, um, intoxicated uh, the atmosphere of cooperation with China, make it even less willing by uh, to cooperate with the United States, especially on uh, issues like uh, the uh, um, uh, region's growth. Right? The, uh, so now you know, you know we've seen how right, that that uh, you, you know you, you know we may probably uh, given this. Sort of a lack of cooperation with China. It was really uh, probably we're never going to find the world by that virus actually uh, come from. Um, but, but in the meantime, it also by the, this uh, created sort of a, contributed to like a more divided society by in a country like the U.S. You know, given this anti-Asian uh, sentiment. That was better. You know, I don't, I don't have too much more to add, except that I, I, I just, it's, it's an interesting question, and I, I actually would put it, um, put it back to you a bit to that. I, I think it's important to separate out the challenge. I, I, I bucket the challenges slightly differently. So the challenges of the types of stigma and bias that might um, arise for for subpopulations within within our own country. And, and we have, as Joe has mentioned, we see that over and over and over again. And so you think about the types of, of ways that that can be addressed and, and people can be protected and how to, how to think about, um, you know, it's not really in vulnerable populations, but populations at risk um, of um, you know, that inappropriate stigma. So I think there's there's that question. And then there is, I, I bucket into a separate um, issue of, the, of of how the um, the government response and dealing with other other countries and 
um, the, the geopolitical tensions that might arise and how that affects the response into a different category. And that's, and Young Chao already kind of addressed some of those, some of those challenges along the way, but um, none of it, none of it is easy and it's often not done sufficiently. Thank you. I'm going to take the next question from a written question from Jose David Vabuena. Uh, he's an undergraduate student at Buffalo State University. And the question is, what are the potential risks and limitations of implementing economic structuralism to improve global health security? Define economic structuralism. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I'm not sure how to answer that because I'm not sure what you what what you want us to get at. All right, so Jose, I think if you're in a place where you can uh, you can join in live uh, or unmute yourself, why don't you do that? And if not, then we'll move to the next question. Here he comes. That, so you said something like the Marxist the sort of argument, right? The economy, right? They just this it determines the the uh, the the uh, right. <laughs> all this the uh, the upper infrastructure or whatever uh, that if that, that that is the case right there you know they I think uh, you know single focus on economic development and certainly right uh, does not help right uh, uh, improving public health even though right the a well-developed economy could find by right, this, you know, the, the positive high correlation, right, between, you know, the, the like high by level of economic development and uh, improved, right, the, the uh, healthcare standards and like uh, the average life expectancy increase. But in the meantime, right, the single focus on economic development could hurt, right, the the, uh, the public health and global health, you know. One of the example, right, the urbanization, right, the, the uh, industrialization, right, the, the uh, uh, curve, the, right, the, the uh, um, sort of uh, um, uh, make us more likely to be exposed by the to those dangerous pathogens, you know, that uh, 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 you know, increase the uh, likelihood of a dangerous pathogen of jumping species, right, to human beings, you know, then start uh, potentially, right, uh, if it uh, uh, obtain that capacity for uh, efficient human-to-human uh, -human transmission by the potential for a pandemic. Um, I, I think uh, I, I just thought out that he's going to reframe the question, but, but um, we're going to talk about economics. Just one, one, one point. I would love to be able to add um, to maybe help frame some of the some of that discussion with with a little bit of data. Um, when we talk about what do we need for health security, I mean, we can talk about the threats and which I was talking about. You know, the challenges for urbanization and globalization, and this land and um, and, and the, the competing challenges of looking at economic development. and um, But, but I, I do want to note, so one of the things that our research team has been doing for about a decade is trying to figure out what it costs each country to be able to develop their capacity to be able to prevent, detect, and respond effectively to public health emergencies based off of their international legal obligations and then also looking at, at each region in context. And um, just so you, everybody has a number in the back of their head, the number that we currently have is approximately $300 billion um, that it would cost at the global scale for every nation to be able to build sufficient and sustain sufficient capacity for health security. That's in addition to approximately 60 to 80 billion that's required at a global scale for things like research and development and supply chain and, and manufacturing. So, so I just to note, we have approximately a $380 billion problem. Um, and we are definitely not spending that right now. And, um, and if we think about it as a problem, the, the pandemic itself costs, well, we're not exactly sure what it costs, but somewhere around 15 trillion. Um, so 300 
billion sounds like a lot, but it's actually very little if you're looking at your return on investment for being able to to address a future pandemic. But it's a lot in the world of public health where there's very little money and there's shrinking budgets and there's shrinking opportunity for nations to be able to actually invest themselves as well as international financing. So I, I'm, I'm using I'm using the, the question as an opportunity to just throw that out there for, so folks understand. Yeah. I also want to throw up, uh, you know, that again, use the pandemic example, right? So that uh, the country that most developed, but uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's the most, well, the, the best prepared, right, for pandemic, right? So the before the pandemic, there was global health security index, right, that that shows the U.S. was one of the best prepared, right? But it as it turned out, it was the worst hit, one of the worst hit, right, by the pandemic. Thank you. I'm going to take the next question. Raised hand from Braden Lowe, uh, who also wrote um, his question, but why don't you ask it? And if you could identify yourself, that would be great. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, my name is Braden Lowe. I'm a graduate student at Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, studying international trade. Um, I, my question is, how effective have multilateral development banks been in the development of health infrastructure in countries that need them? Like, And could there be a greater role for them in the future, such as maybe development banks that are focused primarily on the development of medical infrastructure and facilities and the development of um, medical technologies? Thank you. Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Brandon, it's an excellent question. And I think that the the history of, of the development banks has been mixed over it pre-pandemic and, and in the current situation. Let me start with, well, so yes, the, the banks have been involved in in developing um, health security capacity and uh, as including medical countermeasures, less on the medical countermeasures, more on, on mostly national capacity, regional capacity. Um, and and some have been more involved than others. Uh, the um, Asian Development Bank was really engaged for a long time. ASEAN was really the, the driving factor for coordination in, in that region. Um, the Inter-American Development Bank has been engaged. Um, uh, IMF had programs. So, so there, there have been programs. And prior to the pandemic, the World Bank had something called the PEF, the Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility, that they stood up both for preparedness as well as a response window. That came under a decent amount of um, criticism because the the triggers for using that mechanism were were so stringent that it basically became not helpful. Um, and while the bank and IMF and the regional development banks did assist throughout the pandemic, you could have a, a pretty lively debate on how effective they were, how fast they they got into the game, where they could have done more. I think the, 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 the general lesson is everybody could have done more. But um, where we are right now is that um, the, the G20 high-level independent panel, um, well, the G20 appointed a high-level independent panel that was um, that came up with some proposals for how to better position um, the world for being able to support national level development of pandemic preparedness and response. Um, and the recommendation was to use the the World Bank as the mechanism for that. So about a year and a half ago, um, the World Bank the World Bank board approved the creation of the pandemic fund. Um, as I mentioned before, we have about a $300 billion problem. The first round of, of funds for, that was given out over the summer was for $337 million. Um, so we've got a $337 million went out on a $300 billion program, uh, problem. And there were, and that went to 37 different countries where the, um, the there were proposals, however, from uh, there were 600 proposals that were submitted and these 37 went out. So the next round is out right now. Um, and the plan is for the pandemic fund to buy approximately um, 500, 500 million um, in, in this round. But it, again, so it, it kind of, it depends if, on if you're a, a glass half empty, glass half full, full kind of person. 
on whether you think that the banks are are super engaged and and doing all that they can, or if they're really if if there's a lot more that they could do. And and that's not even getting into all the other mechanisms that that they have contemplated and thought about in terms of of, of being able to use to help countries, um, particularly being able to mobilize resources quickly. Great, thank you. I'm going to take uh, two. Combine two written questions. Um, the first is from Nicole Rudolph, uh, who is an assistant professor at Adelphi University, who is leading initiatives to integrate health security with climate resilience efforts. Uh, and then there's a question from Isabella Smith. I don't know her affiliation. Um, how do you deal with the mass politicization of health safety, um, specifically before and after COVID-19? <laughs> just, just easy ones, right? Um, I, well, yeah, very easy. <laughs> and so, why don't I why don't I do a really quick answer and then and then turn to you, particularly on the health and climate space? I, except for Nicole, I would say that I I'm glad you're working on this. Um, we've always considered um, one health and and climate's first principles of health security and the health security threats. So they they are they are in, in our head completely intertwined and. Um, really need to be addressed that way. I think on to Isabella's question, man, how do you deal with the politics? It's, um, we are in a really, the really complicated environment right now. Um, I'm a public health professional. Uh, before the pandemic, um, most people did not know we existed. And um, maybe that was okay. Uh, it was difficult because there was no money, but, um, but we were kind of quietly left to do our job and we were most successful when people didn't know we existed. The What happened during the pandemic, particularly in the United States, but also around the world, um, we saw the, 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 a lot of these issues had always been political. They had never been partisan before. They became very partisan. And there was a tremendous amount of backlash against public health officials. Um, there are there are um, academic efforts underway to count and capture the just the type of backlash that existed. The fact that there are academics who are measuring there is categories for how many public health officials were threatened with gun violence and didn't get support from their local law enforcement. And the fact that that number is so large that there is a category for counting it gives you a sense of the, the type of backlash that's been experienced. I think it, you know, what you're seeing right now, you know, talk to the United States, but um, a, a, a massive movement to roll back public health authority um, legislation and, and regulations. Um, there are state legislatures across the country that are stripping their governors of emergency powers and putting that authority into the state legislative branches, which is basically going to make it almost impossible to take rapid action in the in the next event and and you know there will be a next event so um so it, it is it is really difficult we are seeing the um based on the vaccine the increase in vaccine hesitancy and in, in part due to the rise in mis and disinformation and now we're seeing measles outbreaks across the country so um and and uh you know situations where the current public health officials are not taking scientifically based action to to stop those outbreaks so we are it, it it's um it's rough out there let me just put it that way and as well, at the same time that people are quitting in droves because people did not sign up for this so yeah uh, so just, just before John John before you before you weigh mm -hmm. in and I'll give you an opportunity uh Rebecca this is a group of professors and students. And so what would you advise? What What's the call to action for this group to, you know, to, to help, you know, push back on or, you know, help sort of make sure to, to, to make sure to ensure that guardrails remain? I, I don't have any, I don't have a great one liner on that, right? Except there is, how do we, how do we rebuild trust in science, in public officials, in governance? Um, there is a, a need to raise public literacy. Uh, and so, so I start there. 
Um, there are a lot of folks who are working on, on how do we counter mis and disinformation. Um, I, I think those are two very different things. Um, there is, I, you know, there is a need to, you know, it's everything from being able to do the the policy surveillance of what's happening in the world to being able to, to, to all the way towards advocacy um, and, and trying to help, you know, get programs and policies sufficiently implemented. But I, I think also just having a, a kind of a strong evidence informed voice. I wish I had a great better answer that said, if we just push this button or did this thing, it would all be better. But I, I don't, and I think I think this is why a lot of the people in community are really struggling with how do we, how did we get here and how do we fix it? Right, Yan John. Well, I right. just to follow Becca said, I think trust is like the key, right? And yeah, you know, our colleague Tom Boyke, right? His research has right this already right demonstrated how important trust is, right? Then, um, the uh, dealing with uh, public health crisis like COVID nineteen, you know, and the quick question is so this is the actual uh, the challenge is how to build the trust. Right, you can talk about right the maybe better transparency, better accountability, but uh, you know, I think in a country like the U.S., which is so divided now, right, uh, I think uh, in order to rebuild that. Trust is very important, right? Uh, for the uh, the different groups, but even like uh, the, the, I'm talking about the you know the uh, the, the two groups, right? That they, they needs to be able to have a dialogue with each other, need to speak with each other. They needs to uh, be able to build consensus. But uh, maybe I'm asking the impossible. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, so when we talk about politicization, I want to also add that it's not just happened at the national, right? It certainly, as the, this past pandemic has shown, right? This also occurs at the international level. In fact, uh, you know, I think it, you know we never you know have you know a public health event you know, that has been so politicized as the, the COVID nineteen. Uh, you know, just to give you an example, right? The the, uh, the science, but right? when we talk about the, the origins of science, but right? the you know the people never thought of like politicizing, right? The, the origin of pro, you know, but uh, it's become a big issue, right? If you're in the COVID pandemic, in part because this is like the first time we're seeing like ideology, you know, being entered by the pandemic response, right? This entire right, the response to the pandemic is sort of framed as a competition between uh, authoritarianism and the liberal democracy, right? Uh, and also uh, geopolitics, right? Again, right, the, the tensions between US and China are uh, sort of also dri uh, driving, right, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, global pandemic response. You know? So I think uh, in order uh, to sort of we need to start to depoliticize <laughs> de uh, this process depoliticization. Uh, we need to reduce the geopolitical tensions, but in the meantime, we need to start uh, uh, the uh, sort of have uh, uh, investing in those trust, uh, this uh, uh, our confidence building measures, like uh, you know, the, uh, having uh, like a track uh, track one point five dialogue, you know, between uh, the two countries. Thank you. I'm going to go next to JY Joe, please. Hello? Yes. Thank Hi. you. Uh, awesome. Um, well, my name is Chris Nelms. I'm an intelligence analysis student at uh, James Madison University. And uh, my question is about threats to global health. Um, specifically, do we threat, do we face any risks like from our adversaries or from uh, lone groups that want to purposely tear down global health? Are there any risks and how do we counter those risks if they exist? That is Rebecca's expertise. <laughs> I got it. Um, 
Maybe I got it. I mean, I think, listen, I, 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 you know, when you start the question, you asked about threats to global health and immediately I start making lists of like, oh my gosh, all right, how are we going to talk about the signal, the what 90,000 signals that WHO received this month and the, you know, 300 that they're investigating and the 30 like field investigations that are happening in a given month and all the, all the emerging infectious disease challenges, including, you know, H5N1 in cows in the U.S. to, um, to, to MPOX to, you know, again, the, 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 the long list of infectious disease challenges that nature throws at us every day. Um, but your, your question then pivoted to, to talk more about um, the threats of deliberate biological events. And that, that's definitely a thing. I mean, so let's just say that that is a thing that is a, an area of work. Um, I will say that for, for about 15 years, I, I supported the U.S. delegation to the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, so there are there are people who get together often and work through trying to assess what that threat is and how how it's best addressed. Um, there are there are mechanisms for trying to investigate allegations of deliberate biological weapons use and the use of the UN Secretary General's mechanism. And there are now um, a lot of folks who are, who are deeply concerned about how AI is changing the, the threat space. Um, and so, so, you know, in this forum, I think the answer we can give you is yes, it is a threat. It is a thing. Um, and there is a world of people who, who work on this, um, including within the intelligence communities around the world, um, to, to better address that threat and then feed that into response um, uh, and planning efforts. I, I will say, though, that it, in, the, in the event, it, I, the, the challenge is if there is actually a, an actual event, the response may not be very different. Um, from a naturally occurring event, at least not initially. And I, putting attribution assessments aside and any kind of political response you might have. But that, that's the other thing that is trying to be sorted out is that, you know, if, if you are in the midst of a response to what looks like a naturally occurring event and suddenly there is information or an entity claims responsibility for having released an agent, um, how does that change? Who, how, what stakeholders now need to be involved? And also, who, how is that managed um, at the national, regional, and international system? So basically, you you, you opened a can of, of a, a huge can of worms for me. Um, but I, I think the the answer is yes. It is a it is a thing, and it is a thing that there are there is a community of people who who think um, very deeply about it. Yeah, it's just a, I think the the problem we're dealing with is like uh, deliberate cause. An outbreak, right? The, 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 the challenge here is that uh, you, you, this is not like a war, right? This uh, against uh, you know, terror, the uh, because right, the, we are facing. Yeah, we don't know actually even who will actually start the attack, right? Whether it's from like individuals or states. And because in part of this also delegitimation of the uh, biological weapons or the use of you know the, the dangerous pathogens, you're not going to find out you know whether you know like uh, something unusual is happening until right a large number of people flood the, the ER rooms complaining about the, the same kind of acute like, symptoms. You know, so uh, the logic of uh, like uh, of deterring right the, such attack. It would be different from uh, the logic of deterring like uh, a nuclear attack, right? Because we have to rely on the building of you know the uh, health infrastructure, you know, better trained health professionals, you know, the the so-called deterrence by deny, by in order to sort of uh, uh, disincentivize the potential perpetrators from giving up, uh, you know, such an uh, attack. Uh, Irina, you are muted. I am muted. And how long have I been doing this? Uh, we've had a lot of questions and, and uh, written and uh, raised hands that we could not get to. So I apologize to all of you. Rebecca, I want to give you 30 seconds to talk about uh, your book, Outbreak oh. Atlas. Yay. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I, I was telling folks before we started the webinar, um, I, 
uh, in academia, we, we write a lot of words um, and often we write words and are, they're you know meant for four people in the world to read. Um, but we, we put a book together that is designed for um, hopefully addressing some of the public literacy issues that we brought up earlier. Um, we were, for years, we had been supporting public health emergency operation centers around the world in helping to provide information about um, kind of all, all the activities that happen in an outbreak response. And what we've done is we've we've taken that and we've written it for a public audience. So it is illustrated. It, is, it has 120 different case studies. Anything you ever wanted to know about what happens in an outbreak or every um, epidemiologic term that, you know, you heard your grandmother talk about that you're like, wait a second, is that right? So we've written it all out. If anybody's interested, Outbreak Atlas. And it uh, comes out on Monday and on Amazon and all those other places. So um, we're really excited. Fantastic. And Yan Zhang, is there anything you want to highlight uh, that we're, we're doing at CFR in the global health well, space? Thank you, Irene. Well, thank you for your patience uh, for staying uh, for that one hour conversation. Uh, so, yeah, we are facing a lot of threats. We are, the, uh, uh, you know, we are aware of this, many of those challenges we are facing. We know the loopholes by the global health, health governance is. Uh, it's just that uh, you know. I think the the challenge is you know, how to fix them. That uh, you know, don't expect uh, those negotiations in Geneva to you know, solve all the problems. The problems are going to result all the time in many decades to come. But if you want to learn more about you know this the the uh, this the, uh, this area, like in addition to read uh, Rebecca's uh, outbreak atlas, you know, read our uh, this this small CSR. I'm negotiating global health so security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so you can also follow them on, on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Yang Zheng Wang and at Rebecca Katz 5. Um, this is the last webinar for the semester. Good luck with your finals and everything that comes with this lovely month of April and May. And for some of you who are graduating, uh, you can learn about CFR paid internships for students and fellowship for professors at CFR.org slash careers. Um, we're open right now. We're accepting applications for summer in, summer internships, and they, they can be virtual. So that's always a plus, and they are paid. Uh, you fo Please follow us at CFR underscore academic. Visit CFR.org, foreignaffairs.com, and I'm going to really highlight, I do it every 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 call, um, but our thinkglobalhealth.org site, uh, which provides a forum to examine why global health matters and to engage in efforts to improve health worldwide. So if you're interested in these issues, you can, uh, you should go there. Um, so we hope to be a resource for you all. Um, again, good luck with your finals. Enjoy the summer. And we look forward to reconvening in fall 2024. So thank you again uh, to Dr. Katz and Dr. Wong.